Thank you, Stephanie, for preaching my sermon for me. <laughs> wow. What a great message and song. Uh, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to John chapter 11. That's what we'll be looking at today. And as you're turning in your Bible, most of you know that we just moved here from the, the farm country and the cotton fields of West Tennessee. Well, I heard about a man from there who uh, uh, was a farmer. Didn't get to town very much. Usually when he went to town, it was just to take his crops there to sell. While he was in town, he was at the farmer's market, and he won a competition. Uh, it was right before Labor Day, and he won uh, a round-trip tickets for he and his family of four to go to the big city of New York, to go to the Labor Day parade that was going to be there in New York. So uh, he made his reservations at the Sheraton International Hotel, and uh, they hopped on a Greyhound bus and rode all the way to New York City with he and his family, his wife and two children, and made it there to the Sheraton Hotel, and uh, uh, they were just blown away by the magnitude of this. They had never been to a place like this. Going to town was nothing like going here to New York City. And so they're there for the Labor Day parade, and they uh, get, go to their hotel to check in, and it's marble and granite and huge, and uh, people are dressed up, and he's wearing his overalls, and it uh, looks like a, a country farmer. Well, he uh, goes in and uh, makes his reservation. He brings his son. His son's name was Clem. He takes Clem over, and they see this bright, shiny wall that the doors moved. And it's encased in a cube. And so the doors would open, and there's this cube inside. They didn't know what this was. So they stared there at, at this, these metal doors that would open back and forth. And were just amazed by this. And so Clem and his dad were looking at this elevator, and this, uh, an elderly lady walked in. She walks in, and they're just looking at this, and the door's closed behind, and all of a sudden these lights start lighting up. And then a few minutes later, the doors open back up, and this beautiful young lady comes walking out of the elevator. <laughs> and the dad says to his son, go get your mom. <laughs> Maybe some of our church members who may be in New York City this week for that very reason. I don't know. But I'm glad you're here. We're going to celebrate what Jesus has done and what Jesus can do. Not just on Labor Day weekend, but in every day of your life. So if you have your Bibles, turn to John chapter 11. We're going to begin reading. Out of the respect of God's Word, will you stand with me? We're going to begin reading in verse 1. It says, Now a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. It was that Mary who anointed the Lord with fragrant oil and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore the sister sent to him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. Now, Heavenly Father, bless your public reading of your scripture this morning. Amen. And you may be seated. We're going to look at just about the entire chapter of John chapter 11, but we want to begin by looking at three, these first three verses at the fact that Lazarus, he's sick and he's about to die. So the family has called for the physician, the great physician, Jesus Christ. But you see, there's one thing about this story that we... As we're reading this, we know, and Jesus knows, but those who are calling for him don't know that Jesus, he already knows the situation. He knows the outcome. But the first thing is that Jesus loves this family. These, these are dear, precious people to him. He loves them. They are his friends. He calls them by name. He knows them in a, in a particular way. He loves this family. Uh, he, he has spent time with Martha and Mary and Lazarus. And so he loved them. Secondly, not only did he love this family, Jesus already knew the outcome. Jesus knows the outcome of what's about to happen. Even before he arrives on the scene, he already knows what's going to take place. Uh, down in verse 14. If you'll look down in verse 14... Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus 
is dead. Now, up to this point, up to verse 14, the disciples are asking the question, when are we going to go? When are we going to leave? When are we going to get there? It reminds me a lot of riding in the car with children. <laughs> are we there yet? Are we there yet? Where are we going? What's that? Are we there yet? And the disciples are asking this question over and over. Now, I know none of y'all had kids to do that, right? Okay, well, I do. And what happens when your kids do that? Maybe in the very beginning you might say, oh, well, we're just now leaving the driveway, children. It'll be, it'll be a while. And then you might say, well, we'll stop at the next McDonald's to get lunch. But after a while of hearing the repetitiveness, are we there yet? Where are we? What's going on? And just constantly going on. Finally, and I know y'all would never do this, but this driver will say, stop talking! We're not there yet! I can almost hear a little bit of frustration as Jesus is having to deal with His disciples, who He is training, He is bringing them along, but after the constant questioning, Jesus finally has to say, He's dead. You see, the disciples didn't know this. They thought their friend was sick. And why is it that Jesus is not hurrying to go? Why is it that we haven't left yet? Why aren't we there yet? Our Jesus knows the outcome. Now, in His bodily form, He was not there. But because our Jesus is everywhere, He knew that Lazarus was already dead. What that tells me is that our Jesus, who is everywhere, knows what you are going through. He knows the scenario in your life. He knows the trouble you may be experiencing. He feels your pain. He knows because He's in control of everything. That's the third thing in your, in your uh, if you're filling out the form there you got in your bulletin. The third thing is that God is in control of everything. And everything happens to help our faith. It is there for our uh, uh, faith and for His glory. Go to verse 15. Just after He is, has said to His disciples in a very stern voice, basically stop asking the question, He's already dead because He knows. Now He shows His tender compassion and His a heartfelt desire to help his disciples. In verse 15 it says, And I am glad for your sakes that I was not there. Well, that doesn't sound very compassionate, does it? But he's actually showing a very compassionate moment to help his disciples, but also to help those that he's going to come in contact with. I am glad for your sakes that I was not there, that you may believe. Nevertheless, let us go to Him. So in other words, after Jesus had that turn around the car moment, telling the disciples very frankly, Lazarus is dead. But it's okay. I'm actually glad that I wasn't there. And for your benefit, for your sakes, you're going to see the mighty hand of God. So let's go. And that's what happens. All because God is in control of everything. So that is the scenario of how Lazarus is now dead. But I want us to go to a very familiar passage, and that goes into our next set of verses, verses 17 through 36, looking at what you might have learned when you were a child, the shortest verse in the Bible, Jesus wept. That's found in verse 35, but let's begin reading first in verse 17. Because we're going to see that Lazarus is already in the tomb. In verse 17 it says, So when Jesus came, he found that he had already been in the tomb four days. So after the, the process of, the, uh, uh, of taking care of Lazarus and the grieving process of the family, they have now moved him to the tomb, and he's been there for four days. Just as we just heard a message in song, Praise God, when Jesus is four days late, He's right on time. Things may not be happening at your speed. Things may not be going according to your plan. But God, who is in control of everything, when He shows up, He shows out. 
And he does things according to his timetable, not yours. But Lazarus was in the tomb four days. The second thing, as we look at the fact that Jesus is going to weep, is that he is our hope and our life. Look at verse 21. Now Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. And Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. And he who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? And she said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who has come into the world. Now, as Jesus is talking to Martha, Martha has made an incredible declaration, a declaration of faith, that she has put her hope, her trust, her love and devotion into Jesus Christ. The one mistake that she makes is found in, the verse, in verse 21, when she says, if you had been here, you could have prevented this. If you had been here, he wouldn't have died. Well, that's the one mistake. Because while in bodily form he was not there, as we know, Jesus is everywhere. And even if he, his body had been halfway around the world, he still had the power and the control to prevent the death of Lazarus. That just wasn't part of his plan. Jesus wanted Lazarus to die. He allowed Lazarus, his good friend, to die. And so, uh, but beside that one minor error in Martha's statement, everything else is incredible. Uh, go back to that again. If you had been here, my brother would not have died. She believes in his power. Uh, but I know that even if you ask him right now, God will grant you whatever you ask of him. Uh, she believes that, that he will rise again because she believes in the resurrection. Not all uh, people in her day believed in that. The Sadducees did not believe in a, a resurrection. And so she's going against some of the religious leaders of her time. She believed in what Jesus taught, not in what the, the religious leaders of their day taught. She had her faith, and she was totally surrendered to Jesus Christ. And she believed that Jesus, when he said, I am the resurrection and the life, do you believe this? And she said yes. She is making a very bold statement here that she believes wholeheartedly everything that Jesus has said and done, even though the rest of the world, even though the, the, the media outlets, even though the, the rumor mill, even though everybody else was saying that Jesus was a nut job, that he was a, a freak, that everything he was doing was of the devil and not of God, she knew better. And she surrendered totally to Jesus Christ. Because he was her hope and her life. I hope today you have put your hope in Jesus Christ. That you've already made a decision to make him your Lord and Savior. But if you haven't, let today be your day where you surrender to him. Where you say, I want this same Jesus Christ to save me from my sins and become Lord of my life. I want him to be my hope and my life to give me life abundantly here on earth. But more importantly, life eternal in heaven with Him. After we see that Jesus is our hope and our life, we also see that Jesus pours out His tears and His heart. He pours out His tears and His heart because of the grief that's being shared here among His friends. Look at verse 33. Therefore, when Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who came with her weeping... He groaned in the spirit and was troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Then in verse 35, Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, see how he loved them? Now, this passage is often used. You, like I said earlier, you may have memorized this verse because it is the shortest verse in the Bible. It is often used but also often misinterpreted, misunderstood as to the reason why Jesus wept. The most common uh, argument as to why Jesus wept that I hear is I hear people say, Jesus wept because of their lack of faith. 
They were troubled. They didn't have enough faith. And so they were weeping, and that groaned Jesus in the Spirit. That troubled Him in the Spirit, and He wept because of their lack of faith. Well, wait a minute. Didn't we just read a very powerful declaration by Martha saying who Jesus was, what she believed, that Jesus Christ had the power to raise Lazarus, that Jesus, Jesus Christ was the Son of God, that He was the resurrection and the life. She had her faith in the right place. So I don't believe, like many experts might tell you, that Jesus wept because of their lack of faith. But what about these who came and were, were witnesses to it? Those who were observing and saw Jesus and, and mentioned Him, they thought He was crying because of how much He loved Lazarus. And He missed Lazarus. He was troubled because His friend was now dead. Well, I don't believe that either. I believe what these witnesses saw and what they uh, believe themselves, it's just they were incorrect. Jesus was not troubled because His friend Lazarus was now gone. You see, when we lose a loved one, and, and Jeff mentioned that yesterday, or uh, Friday, Friday, after, Friday evening, we get news that, that uh, one of my uncles passed away, uh, 64 years young, and uh, uh, I'll be going this week to uh, preach his funeral in, uh, near, near Corinth, Mississippi. It was troubling. Uh, I, I didn't see that coming. It was, it was a shock to my system, and, uh, and our family will, will miss him greatly. And I know we'll shed a lot of tears. You see, we weep when we, when we lose somebody like that. Somebody who's dear. Somebody that we would like to see again, and we can't. We weep. But see, Jesus doesn't have that same mentality. Jesus was not weeping because He wouldn't see His friend Lazarus again. Jesus knew that where Lazarus was, was so much better than where He previously was. Jesus knew that Lazarus was in a great place, that he was now in the presence of God. And Jesus in his heart would be celebrating that his friend Lazarus has now graduated to his eternal home in heaven. So Jesus was not weeping because he missed his friend. You want to know why I believe Jesus was weeping? I share this a lot with grieving families. I believe Jesus wept because he saw the anguish, the grief, the hurt within his friends. He saw his friends, Martha and Mary, who were hurting. Their soul, their spirit, their body, their heart, everything about them was hurting because they missed their brother, Lazarus. And while Jesus knew where he was, and Jesus knew the final outcome. Jesus knew that, that we would all one day be able to be in, 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 together again in heaven. I believe Jesus was weeping because when we hurt, He hurts. When you're going through a very difficult time, you may feel all alone. You may feel depressed. You may feel like no one else cares. But Jesus does. Jesus loves you. And when you cry, Jesus is there crying with you. When you celebrate, He's there to celebrate with you. But He never leaves you. He never forsakes you. You are never abandoned because He is everywhere. He is in control of everything. He knows everything. He's there because He loves you. So I believe that Jesus is weeping because His dear friends were hurting so bad. That tells us there's compassion within our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And He loves you, and He's there for you to give you that same amount of compassion. When you hurt, He's hurting with you. When you grieve, He's grieving with you. The difference, though, is that not only does He grieve with you, does He hurt with you, He's not there just to shed a tear with you. He does that because He empathizes with you, He loves you, but He's also there to pick you up. To not leave you there in that state, but to bring you along to make you a better. To make you whole. To make you who He desires for you to be. And that is in His image. Well, I want you to now move down to verse 38. Verse 38 shows an incredible, 
incredible act of God. As Jesus now says, Lazarus, come forth. He says in verse 38, he tells him to take away the stone. Read with me in verse 38. Then Jesus, again groaning in himself, came to the tomb. And it was a cave, and a stone lay against it. And Jesus said, take away the stone. You ever been to a cemetery? You ever been to a cemetery where uh, uh, they need to exhume the body? I have. It's, it's not, a, not a fun sight. I'll, I'll tell you of one instance, and this was not to, to bring up the body, this was to move the body. We were at a, a cemetery and uh, the, the funeral home buried the body in the wrong spot. But it was just one spot over. It's an interesting, interesting story. And so the, the widow decided that was not the right spot. That's not where she wanted her deceased husband to be buried. So she wanted him moved to the right spot, one spot over. And so uh, the smart people, not me, I was not one of the smart ones there trying to figure this out, they decided what we were going to do was to dig up the, 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 the two spots, the one where he's supposed to be, and then the spot where we accidentally put him. And then once we get this big giant hole, we're going to fill that hole up with water. Yeah, I see a lot of faces going like, what? Well, he's, he's in a, a, a fiberglass vault or whatever they make those out of nowadays. And uh, they're going to fill this thing up with water. You know what that vault does? It begins to float. I had no idea. I'm standing out there watching this in amazement. And the vault floats up. We tie ropes around it. And one guy gets down in there with the vault. And, we, and I help. I'm so in, in shock by this. I can't, I can't help but be a part of it. And so I grab the rope and we pull the vault over to the other side where it's supposed to be buried. And then we use a pump and drain the water out and fill it back up. But I got to tell you, I have been at countless funerals. I've preached so many of them. When they were digging that up, I was a little bit scared. I had no idea what to, to, to expect. It was incredible. And here Jesus is telling them, roll away the stone. We're going to open up this tomb. Roll away the stone. Only Jesus can do something so incredible. And then, just as he was sharing with Martha and asking her about her belief, he asked that question again. If you would believe, verse 40 says, Jesus said to her, Did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? Now, fortunately, Martha has made that statement. Yes, I believe. And so because of her belief, she was able to see the glory of God. So what happens next? It's down here in the south. If, if Jesus was living in Georgia, he would have said, come here. Look at verse 41. Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead man was lying. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. And I know that you always hear me. But because of the people who are standing by, I said this, that they may believe that you sent me. Now when these things, when he had said these things, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. Can you just imagine this? The, the, the stone has been rolled away. Jesus is just now praying so that others can hear him talking to his father. And then he just cries out, Lazarus, come forth. He wanted to make sure that Lazarus came forth and no one else. <laughs> that would have been a scary moment. Yeah, they may film some zombie TV show not too far from here in Georgia, but that would have been the real thing. If Jesus had just said, come here, and all the graves started opening up. But Jesus called out his friend. Jesus called Lazarus by name. Why? Because he knew him by name, just like he knows you by name. 
And he calls his friend, tells us to come forth. And then in verse 44, And he who had died came out bound, hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was wrapped with a cloth. And Jesus said to them, Loose him and let him go. Then many of the Jews who had come to Mary had seen these things that Jesus did, believed in him. Isn't that incredible? They saw the mighty hand of God, and it caused them to believe. They believe that Jesus could do anything, and he can. He knows it all, he's in control of it all, and he has power over all. In John chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus tells us very clearly that he is the way and the truth and the life. The way, the truth, and the life. If you want to have life and you want to have it eternal, it is only found in Jesus Christ. Only Jesus can save you from your sins. Only Jesus can resurrect you from the dead. Only Jesus can give you eternal life. You must trust in Him. No one comes to the Father except through Him. He's the way, the truth, and the life. So let me ask you a question here today. What is it that makes Jesus weep? What is it that makes Jesus weep today? Well, as we've already discovered, it's our pain. When you are in pain, when you are suffering, when you're hurting, Jesus weeps with you. He hurts with you. He groans when you groan. Because if you are His child, He does not want to see you go through difficulty. Now, we are living in a fallen world. We will go through difficulty. We will weep. But you have the assurance that Jesus will weep with you. Because He loves you. He knows you by name. He's called you out by name. He weeps with you because of our pain. The second thing, I, I, this is out of place for our PowerPoint, so you need to skip ahead. But our, our second one is our sin. Jesus Christ weeps over our sin. Yes, we may be living in a fallen world, and you may be a fallen person, and you may sin daily, but Jesus weeps when we sin against Him. Against Him and Him only have we sinned. And it breaks His heart. It grieves Him when He was hanging on that cross Dying for the sins of mankind to take away the sins of the world. It broke his heart. He died because of our sins. And he weeps because of our sins. But you know what also causes our Lord and Savior to weep? Yes, he may weep when his children are hurting. And yes, he, he weeps bitterly over our sins that separate us from God. But he also weeps over our joy for your salvation. When you make the decision to ask for forgiveness of your sins and ask Jesus Christ to cleanse you and to, to come into your life and you surrender your life to him, he weeps with joy over your salvation because you are now made right with God and you are now a child of God and He is so excited. Those are tears of joy that He wants to have for each and every one of you. If you're here today and you've never surrendered your life to Jesus Christ and never asked Him to come into your life, right now His tears are over your sin. Can we change that here today? Would you allow Him to bring tears of joy into your life? Would you allow Him to save you from your sins so that you can experience His tears of joy? That's what He wants to give you. That's what He wants to do for you. He wants to save you, to change you, to make you perfect in His image. We're going to have a time of invitation. In just a moment, we're going to stand and sing this hymn, I Surrender All. Have you surrendered your all to Him? Have you given Him control of your life?
Have you made Him your Lord? If not, then this hymn is for you. Not for you to sing it with all gusto and louder than anybody else. That's great. But if you need to surrender your all to Him, then it's for you to come down the aisle to grab me or Brother Jeff by the hand and say, I want to be saved. I want to surrender my all to Jesus Christ. Today you can. Maybe you're here today and you say, I want to surrender my all by, by, by becoming a member of, of this great church. I want to be used by God to serve Him here. I want to worship Him here. I want to be a part of the family of Chestnut Grove. Then this invitation is also for you. Maybe you're here today and you're a, a Martha or a Mary. No, not by name, but by heart. Your heart is hurting. You're grieving. There may be no one else in this room who knows anything about it, but Jesus knows. Jesus knows what you're going through. And when you're crying over it, He's crying with you. When you're hurting, He's there putting His arm around you. You may want to come and pray with one of us. You may want to pray where you are. But allow the Holy Spirit to embrace you in His arms, to love you, to carry you, and to make you who He desires for you to be. This is your time to get along with God because this is His invitation to you. Our Heavenly Father, we pray that as we've heard Your Word, Your message proclaimed, God, I pray that we are surrendering our hearts to You at this time. And we give You this invitation. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. We stand.